hello. Um, so uh, from the neuroaesthetic point of view, um, new reasons for the supposed new interest in beauty, there are really two. Um, number one, uh, it's based on our a new understanding of what beauty is, which is in turn based on a new understanding of how the visual brain functions. Now, when I say a new understanding of what beauty is, again, I'm not looking to define it. Um, I'm only looking uh, towards a description of beauty as an experience signifying the stability of the, or the stabilization of the otherwise unstable, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but the second point is perhaps more interesting to the neurobiological side of things, and that is the new understanding of how the brain functions. Now, the visual system is itself a subsystem of the brain and is itself composed of a number of subsystems. Um, here we can see visual areas one through five. Um, these are critical for the, per, the visual perception of what might be called the three principal aspects of vision, that is to say, uh, form, color, and motion. And unlike past understandings of neurobiology, um, we hold vis the visual system to uh, have a number of these characteristics. Um, there are multiple subsystems that act generally autonomously with respect to one another. They are differentiable in function, space, and time. That is to say, they are specialized, localized, and function asynchronously. Um, they project in parallel, not in hierarchy, and they are non-tillic, meaning that there are both inputs and outputs at every single step. And this means that there is no one single pontifical part of the visual brain that acts to bind visual consciousness um, and is the seat of consciousness. So we can actually speak of three mutually relatively independent attributes of vision, form, color, and motion. And in uh, Zeki's uh, literature, we talk about the micro-consciousnesses of these aspects. Another way to put this is that each processing site is itself also a perceptual site. I can say a little bit more about that in the Q&A if we'd like. Um, now, this lends a sort of plurality to the way the visual system functions and the experience of beauty that comes about from it. And I think Graham does a really great job in his article in the collection, um, speaking of beauty, the experience of beauty, uh, in terms of the figurative and as opposed to the literal. Now, we have a similar idea in neuroaesthetics, and this is the idea of ambiguity. It's a bit of a um, terminological shift here. Um, what does ambiguity mean in the relevant sense? Well, we might call something unambiguous if there is one way that we are certain of to interpret a given stimulus. And so the brain sort of just interprets it in that one way, um, and we call that stimulus unambiguous. An ordinary understanding of the term ambiguity is that, well, we're not too sure. We're uncertain of a number of different ways that we could interpret a given stimulus. And so what we end up doing is not really interpreting it at all. We sort of push it to the side, and we call that ambiguous. That's not the relevant sense. Neuroaesthetics uh, uses the term ambi ambiguity in this way. We are met with a stimulus, and we are met with a number of ways in which to interpret that stimulus, and we have equal certainty of all, in all of those ways. And so ultimately, the brain ends up interpreting that stimulus in all of those ways sort of at the same time. Um, and what this does is it leads to quite a non-literal enriched reading 
of the stimulus. So I have an example here, not necessarily from architecture, but um, a, a quite canonical example that I think illustrates this quite well. Um, I think everyone would agree that this is a beautiful painting. Maybe not a beautiful person, who knows, but that's a different story. We're talking about the painting and its beauty. Um, we are met with the girl with the pearl earring. And uh, we are met with, immediately, two subjects, a girl and a pearl earring. Now, the pearl earring, um, we can talk about it. We know exactly what Vermeer meant when he uh, named this the pearl earring. We can all point to the pearl. However, the pearl itself does not exist. Obviously, there is no actual pearl in this painting, but there is also no depiction of a pearl. Instead, what there is are two white brush strokes representing the reflection off of the girl's cheek and um, collar. And so the pearl both exists and does not exist at the same time, and we interpret it in this way perhaps lending itself to an enriched reading of this particular section, crucial section, of the painting and its beauty. And likewise, her expression. Now, she has no eyebrows. The eyebrows are um, quite an unambiguous uh, way to indicate emotion. By removing the eyebrows, we remove that unambiguity. Um, side note, the Mona Lisa also has this feature. Um, we recognize her as just beginning to speak, or perhaps just having spoke. Um, she seems both distant and close. She seems both turning towards us and away from us. She seems like she's looking at us at a distance, but also longingly. And we have no real way to decide on one of those interpretations as opposed to the others. And so what we do is we interpret them all at the same time. The onus is then placed on the perceiver, in a way, to complete the object. By concluding a determinate, or maybe a set of determinate interpretations from an indeterminate set of possible interpretations. And we're certain that all of these are just equally as possible. So ambiguity, the ambiguity in this indeterminate set of equally certain interpretations is recognized by the brain. It doesn't confuse it, it is recognized it's the set that is recognized. And it, it itself becomes stabilized. Zeki writes that it becomes stabilized in its own instability. Every time we return to this painting, we run through all of these possible interpretations. So um, one way to put this is that it shows not mere stability like in the case of the red book that I explained before, but it, depict, it um, presents to us what we call meta-stability, a second-order stability, stability in its instability. So beauty, then, we might explain, on the one hand, from a neurobiological perspective, as an experience signifying stabilization, sure, of an otherwise unstable external world. But we might also explain beauty or think of beauty as an experience signifying meta-stabilization as well. Same sort of operations, but at a higher cognitive level. Again, this stabilization or meta-stabilization speaks to the primary function of the brain, that is, knowledge acquisition, making sense of the world. This is very salient to us and to our brains. It's not only why beauty matters, but also why we now have new reasons for uh, our interest in it. Thank you. All right, I look forward to the discussion with Taylor.
I should first warn you that I don't have any slides, and the reason for that is I'm a philosopher and I can never figure out which slides to show except for pictures of dead philosophers. Um, so I'd rather <laughs> challenge myself to stay interesting uh, without any props. I'm very excited about the topic of this conference. Yale and I have been talking about this since the spring, I believe, in Los Angeles. Because uh, the American philosopher George Santayana in the early 20th century once made an interesting point, which is that philosophy, uh, sorry, beauty plays a very small role in philosophy, although it plays a very large role in our lives. We make aesthetic decisions constantly. Uh, what to wear, what to, where to live, um, and so forth. Uh, beauty is somehow central to our reality as living beings, but it has played a relatively minor role in our intellectual life so far, especially in philosophy. And I am one of those who say that aesthetics should be first philosophy. Aesthetics is the basis of philosophy, not ethics as Levinas says, as much as I like Levinas. Aesthetics is the root of philosophy. And I'm in a dangerous position here because I'm giving a keynote tomorrow. I don't want to give away all my ideas. I want to tempt you all to come back for that. So I'll try to hint at some things here rather than revealing them in full. So if there's a return of beauty, why did it have to return? If beauty is something so great that we all appreciate, why was it ever gone in the first place so that we have to bring it back? Partly, I think that's because we are moderns, and modern civilization revolves around knowledge, the discovery of knowledge, the production of knowledge. Uh, and really, there are only two kinds of knowledge. You can uh, someone ask you what something is, you can tell them what it's made of, you can tell them what it does. I challenge you to find another form of knowledge than those. If someone asks you what uh, a specific chemical is, you can either tell them the, uh, the atoms out of which it's built, the historical process through which it was synthesized, uh, where in the world, which laboratory it's synthesized, and so forth. So you can learn a lot about the backstory of the chemical, but all those factors do not give you the chemical itself. There's something called emergence over and above that. There, a thing is more than all the components to which you can break it down. That's one kind of knowledge. The other kind of knowledge is you can talk about what the thing does. In the case of the chemical, you can talk about the various uses it has, the various possible interactions it has with other chemicals, and so forth. What you're doing in both cases is that you are explaining a thing away in terms of its relation to other things, whether it's its own parts or the environmental entities with which it interacts. You're losing the intrinsic. You're losing that which a thing is in its own right. And whatever else beauty may be, it is something intrinsic. Uh, beauty is not something that can be explained away in terms of its background causes or in terms of the specific effects it has on us, because there's a beauty in the thing over and above the effects it has on us. There's something intrinsic in the thing that makes it beautiful, even if we have some parts in that experience ourselves. And I would say that this leads to two possible attitudes. One of them I would call rationalism, the other I would call relationism. Rationalism meaning you think you can explain what a thing is made of completely. Relationism, the idea that a thing is only what it is in terms of other things. And now that I teach in an architecture school, I see that the, when I sit on juries for student projects, I see that students have a hard time justifying forms in their own terms. Students will always, if you, if you ask a student why they designed the building this way, they will always, as a default, tell you about the process through which they arrived at that form. They had some five or six stage set of transformations where they started with a broom and a vacuum cleaner and combined those forms somehow and then translated it through several steps to end up with the final building. Uh, they have a hard time doing the really difficult thing, which is to explain the form in its own terms. And it's not only beauty that would do this, I would say, but it is philosophy that does this. Uh, knowledge is very important. I don't want to say anything against knowledge. Uh, the human species needs knowledge to survive. 95% uh, of us would die a violent death if we all stopped studying, I'm sure. Nonetheless, knowledge does not exhaust cognition. I would not say that the appreciation of beauty is something that can be paraphrased in terms other than those of the, its immediate apprehension. You can certainly say things about the beauty that help you understand it. And actually, I, I agree with uh, Taylor and Ron that to understand something doesn't ruin it. But I still think that beauty is something distinct from the understanding of it. And I'll say something about that shortly at the end of my presentation. But um, for me, the important thing about philosophy is that the root of the, of the term, the Greek word philosophia, means a love of wisdom. It means that you don't ever get the wisdom. Philosophy is not a form of knowledge. 
Philosophy, like the aesthetic fields, is a kind of cognition that is not quite a form of knowledge. It's something else. Uh, you may recall, if you ever read some Platonic dialogues, that Socrates is the one who always pleads ignorance. The only thing he knows is that he knows nothing. And although Socrates is famous for always asking for definitions of terms like virtue and friendship and justice, he ought to be equally famous for the fact that he never arrives at any definitions. There's no Platonic dialogue in which we actually learn the proper definition of what anything is. And I say that's not an accident. It's because philosophy is philosophia. You approach what the thing is. You never get a literal definition of what it is. Now, speaking of literalism, since Taylor brought this up in his uh, talk, and we might discuss this in our organized uh, interaction here in a moment, uh, I will say tomorrow my keynote that the opposite of the beautiful is not the ugly. The beautiful and the ugly are more like cousins in a strange way. The opposite of the beautiful is the literal, I will say. And I'll leave some of that for tomorrow, but what is the literal? Well, when something is literal, you are saying that it is equal to the sum total of its qualities. And that if you learn what all, all of the qualities or properties the thing has, you have exhausted it. I was just rereading yesterday uh, this wonderful book by the young German philosopher Marcus Gabriel, for, of whom I have a high opinion. And Gabriel, unfortunately, is a literalist. He thinks that a thing is equal to the sum total of truths that obtain of it. I say that it's not, because I say truth involves a relation to the person observing it. And there's actually a core to the thing that can never be made manifest in any truth. There's always a surplus to the thing, something over and above what we can say about it. Now, the, the most literalist moment in the history of philosophy, I would say, is the group of philosophers known as British empiricists. This is the group in the late 1600s and early 1700s. I'm referring to names like John Locke, George Berkeley, David Hume, above all. Uh, what is characteristic of this group is that they tend to be suspicious of the existence of what we would call objects. Uh, Hume would say, for example, that there isn't really an apple. There's no such thing, there's not a thing called apple that's a bearer of qualities. Instead, all you see are the qualities. You see red, round, hard, cold, spherical, sweet, crisp. And since these qualities or features go together so often, you sort of arbitrarily invent this nickname, Apple. But the Apple isn't something over and above those qualities. The thing simply is its qualities. Now that's radical enough, but it becomes even more radical because Hume says the same thing about each and every one of us. You think you are a self that goes through all these experiences from birth to death. Actually, all you are is a bundle of perceptions, Hume says. You have one experience, and then another experience, and then another, and you sort of imagine that there's this thing called a self behind that experience, holding them all together. When in fact, the British empiricists, that's a sort of illusion. Right? The qualities are all that exist. This is why I call the British empiricists literalists. Now, one of the problems with literalism is that it cannot explain artworks. It cannot explain anything aesthetic. That includes architectural works. You cannot explain a building by describing all of its qualities accurately. There's something a bit more that you can never quite put your finger on. And this is why there's never any final work in architectural criticism, art criticism, food criticism, this sort of criticism always involves a sort of oblique or poetic relation to its topic. You can't have a final solution uh, to what Gehry's uh, Guggenheim and Babau really means. There will always be further uh, works of criticism that approach it in different ways. So uh, what is an anti-literal philosophy by contrast? I would say phenomenology, which I know Taylor also likes. Because in a way, what phenomenology does that has been too seldom noticed, and I'm speaking here about Edmund Husserl, Merleau-Ponty, um, Heidegger, you can put it in the phenomenological camp as well to some extent. Uh, the phenomenologists simply reverse the standpoint of British empiricism. They say that the object comes first and the qualities come second. Why is that? Because according to Husserl, I look at this microphone and I spin it in my hands and I'm seeing constantly a different perception of the microphone every millisecond. But never am I saying, oh, this microphone is 98.3% similar to the one of a tenth of a second ago, and therefore I will arbitrarily call it the same microphone, arbitrarily positing this hidden unit behind the qualities. No, you see the microphone, and you're seeing it from different angles. That's what we experience. And Merleau-Ponty says beautifully uh, somewhere, the black of an ink pen and the black of an executioner's hood are different blacks, even if they have the exact same wavelength of light because somehow the, the black of the executioner's hood is impregnated with that ominous air of death and damnation about it, whereas obviously the black of an ink pen 
doesn't have that at all. Let me just say in closing that the, the reason I agree with Ron and Taylor that knowledge doesn't ruin beauty, the analogy would be the case of emergence in chemistry. It was discovered, uh, John Stuart Mill, I think, was the first to say that in chemistry, unlike physics, if you put two things together, they're not just the sum of their parts, they're more. Uh, hydrogen and oxygen both fuel fire. Put them together, you get water, which extinguishes fire. Now, unfortunately, that was initially viewed in a mystical way that you can't explain it. There's no explanation for why hydrogen and oxygen together quench fire. Um, but actually, that's not necessary. What emergence really means is that a new thing is created over and above the hydrogen and the oxygen. In fact, quantum chemistry fully allows us to predict the properties of water uh, when hydrogen and oxygen are combined. So it's not that the knowledge ruins the mystery. It's that the thing is something more than the knowledge, nonetheless. I'll leave it there. Thank you. So, you, I thought you have a, another. Ah, oh, you did. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm dreaming. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. No, sorry. So, do you have any questions to each other? Yes, I'm sure you do. Now. Um, an anti-reductionist prejudice against neuroaesthetics would be, oh, they're just going to reduce everything to the brain. What's the, what's the most succinct way to alleviate their worries? If someone comes up to you and, and says, aren't you just reducing everything to brain activity, how do you go about answering that concern? Well, uh, typically what I would do is point to Semir Zeki and say, I've never seen anybody enjoy art more than this man. And uh, he knows just about everything there is to know in neuroaesthetics because he is the man who developed it. Um, and so uh, there's an empirical, uh, a bit of empirical evidence that um, if, if explanation extinguishes experience, um, we would see it here and we don't. I would venture to say. Um, but also, methodologically speaking, um, you brought up phenomenology. And I think, uh, in particular, I mean, there are different brands of neuroaesthetics, surely. But Zeki's brand um, is interesting to me, in particular, um, because its explanatory arrow, as it were, points in the, other, in the opposite direction from what is usually expected. So like I said, what's usually expected when a neuroscientist talks about art or beauty is that we're going to explain it entirely in terms of what's going on in the brain um, and say, and explain the experience in light of the neurobiological evidence. But that's not what we're doing. Instead, what we're doing is we are prompting these experiences and looking to explain the brain in terms of them. Oh. And so there is no uh, danger of reducing in that sort of direction. So you're aestheticizing the brain rather than neurologizing aesthetics. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Fascinating. I also wanted to put in a good word for ambiguity. Um, a lot of times ambiguity is seen as a poor man's clarity, that you just need to be a little more clear and it's just a starting point and we start with the implicit and we have to make it explicit as in Robert Brandom's philosophy. Uh, ambiguity, I think, is very important uh, because it, it's important not to be more clear than the problem at hand itself is. Premature clarity is one of the unrecognized dangers of thought, I think. And so sometimes it's best to linger with the ambiguity. And I wanted, on that note, I wanted to put in a good word for a hated concept in philosophy these days, which is substance, a concept I like. Um, because I mentioned that the British empiricists tried to get rid of objects by saying objects are just bundles of qualities and there's not really an object there. The tendency today is instead to say, oh, everything's in movement, everything's process flux, there isn't really an object, everything's a gradient or a vector. And you see this in architecture, too during the period of Deleuze's influence and, and even now. But uh, there's something very powerful about the notion of the substance, the ambiguity that can have, it has different qualities at different times. Aristotle points out that happy is always happy, sad is always sad, but Socrates can be happy and then sad, and he's Socrates in both cases. And uh, Saul Kripke, the American philosopher of language, has a certain ambiguity in his concept of the proper name, because the proper name points to a thing rigidly, even if everything you think you know about the person is wrong. So. The, he claims, I think, in the book that the, the average person on the street in the United States will say that Albert Einstein invented the atomic bomb, which is false. 
But once you tell them it's false, they're not going to start using the name Einstein for Oppenheimer or Leslie Groves or whoever really in invented the bomb. You're just going to say, oh, it's a f I thought something false about Einstein. So I'm still pointing at something, even though the qualities are, we're never quite sure whether they're accurate or not. So, uh, um, and of course, as you know, I like metaphorical language, which cannot really be literalized, and this has been known by literary critics for a long time. When, when Homer talks about the wine dark sea in the Odyssey, you can't just say, oh, that means that the Mediterranean is, is basically the same color as certain bottles of wine. You could say that, but then you're missing something because the metaphor is also bringing in the other qualities of the wine and assigning them to the sea, like intoxication, danger, oblivion, and so forth. So ambiguity is actually a powerful uh, tool in our toolbox of cognition, I think. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really intrigued by this idea of aesthetics as first philosophy. I don't know if you're going to talk about it more in your keynote. Excellent, because I wanted to talk to you about it. Um, I completely agree. And I think you did a really uh, good service to philosophy in general and phenomenology uh, with your explanation of the, uh, the microphone in your hand, which in phenomenological jargon would be its transcendence. It goes beyond what's... Uh, simply in my consciousness at any given time from my immediate point of view. There's always something discoverable about the object. And it's, um, this speaks directly to the idea of metaphor and the idea of ambiguity in that there is always something to be discoverable uh, or to settle on or a different way of interpreting um, uh, that we then, rec that so neuroaesthetic says, we recognize as being beautiful. Which in turn um, relates back to what I was talking about with Ron earlier in this, uh, the importance of hidden, the hiddenness of order in mathematical beauty as well. There's always something beyond the reach. I think it's really interesting. Yes, and I would also talk about our awareness of background conditions that aren't explicit, that are important in structuring a situation. So mm -hmm. the classical name for this is rhetoric, another term that has a bad name these days because rhetoric has become mere rhetoric Someone is just trying to persuade and manipulate without trying to give any knowledge. But uh, for Aristotle, for example, rhetoric was simply that which is not quite stated. It's stated without being stated. The example he gives is if I say this man was three times crowned with laurel, any Greek would know that means he won the Olympics three times. That was the prize in ancient Greece for winning the Olympics, a laurel crown. Now, if you come right out and state it, in a sense, you are ruining the rhetorical effect of it. Marshall McLuhan uh, built his whole career, his whole theory of media out of the idea, a rhetorical theory of media, that they're in the background, they never become explicit. They only tend to become explicit once they've been passed historically and they become ancient artifacts. And my favorite example of this is uh, threats, because if you, you've all seen The Godfather, and Vito Corleone always says, I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Any particular threat is not going to be as scary as that, right? If he had said specifically, explicitly, literally, like we're all supposed to do as good thinkers, be ex as explicit as possible, if you don't do what I want to do, I'm going to cut off your horse's head and put it in bed at night when you're sleeping. That's grotesque, but it's not nearly as scary as I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. So there's a, a translation problem between the implicit and the explicit, which forbids our actually making an easy transition between the two. Mm -hmm. So again, three cheers for ambiguity. Good. It was fascinating for me that uh, in the early days of uh, digital architecture, uh, there was a kind of uh, popular argument, especially in Columbia University at the time, uh, that when I read things about it, I said, why? Why it goes this way? And what, and what they said, that the process has to be very rigorous. And they criticize one after another uh, if it was uh, Colatan uh, McDonald as a as a as a team, Shulan Colatan and uh, Bill McDonald, uh, that the work I really admire at the time, and I thought it's extremely beautiful. And in the catalog, you'll see uh, the OK apartment, which I found was so fresh and interesting, and all that. And they were actually claiming that the the, the all didn't wish to accept and criticize the presence of metaphor, thinking metaphorically. And, you know, so it was okay if uh, somebody else like Mark Wolfer would argue about it because there were a lot of them. But the work was so beautiful and, and, and so also ambiguous and all of that. And I said, why? Why you still stick to the, you know, kind of the regime of thinking that was very popular at the time? And uh, so, 
I am very pleased that you know the conversation of metaphor is coming back because I think it's the most human way of thinking as well. It's like if we take it away, and I always brought examples of you know scientists come with metaphor. Black wall, uh, hole was to do with the metaphor. You know, so everybody is using metaphors to be helped to explain things. And uh, but there's a long period, and you can see a lot of writings about it, sort of against the metaphoric, in order to be rigorous and you know convincing and literal. So thank you very much.